let's talk projecting NFL offenses. Okay. Obviously, being the number one in the entire globe, there's a secret <laughs> source to your process. And we obviously, you can't give the secret source away, but how do you go about your process when it comes to rankings to begin with? Like, do you have a base point you start from or, or how do you get started on your rankings? Uh, it depends. Well, it depends what you're talking about. If you're talking about uh, like the draft rankings or in season rankings for the, oh, the draft rankings, I, I start off just with rankings in January. And part of that is because I don't really feel like doing projections in January. I've, at that point, we've gone through 16, 17 weeks of the season, <laughs> you know, still doing a little bit of DFS in the playoffs, but in January, I want to be able to kick back a bit and not have to just grind and grind again. So uh, I kind of go easy on myself there and I just look at the projections, what I think could happen the next season. Also, there's so much player movement that's about to happen mm-hmm. that if you're spending all that time on projections, a lot of it isn't going to matter mm-hmm. in a month or two. Um, I don't do my first projections until free agency happens. And then at that point, you got a much better idea of what rosters are going to look like. You also kind of have an idea maybe of what teams are going to do in the draft. Cause you can look at some of the holes and realize certain teams that are going to go after certain positions. But at that point you have a, a better idea, you know, the coaching changes, you know, you know, the free agency moves and maybe some of the trades that have happened and stuff. And at that point, you know, then it's just a matter of every single time you're working on those projections, digging deeper on something else, whether it's strength, the schedule, whether it's, you know, players who are dealing with serious injuries and having to figure out where they're at and where they're going to be at come next season all those little things start to add up right the historical data the you know the vacated targets and touches and all that sort of stuff you're just every time refining them and refining them until really like this point in the year is probably the first time that I feel great about my projections you never feel perfect about them but at this point in the year I've gone through you know offensive lines and and defensive roster changes and matchups and all that sort of stuff and now you start to go, okay, I got enough data points in there where I feel pretty good uh, about where I have those players. And then during the preseason, we're not going to get one this year, but normally in the preseason, I'm doing a takeaways article every night after the preseason games. And if people underrate the preseason. I know you don't learn that much about starters, but you learn a lot about depth players. And when those injuries happen during the season and you know, you know what, they were playing this guy a lot. He looked really good in the preseason. I think I'm going to grab that running back. It gives you some more insight. Now we're not going to have that this year. So that's kind of unfortunate. We're going to have to make a lot of decisions early in the year. It's going to be kind of like the preseason, maybe in the first few weeks. Um, but come the season, then I'm publishing those. So just on that, going back to the the draft rankings and, and building up for the season, how much does doing drafts, best balls in particular, and looking at ADP shifts and data sway your rankings is there any sway in it or is it like no i'm committed to my process i know it works you're not overly fussed or bothered about the adps that you're getting in, in best balls in, in uh, may june early july i mean for example. i'm looking at all that adp information so it's in the back of my mind somewhere because i'm looking at it for the drafts i'm doing and for the advice that i'm giving right if you're talking about breakouts and busts and sleepers mm-hmm. That all is because of the ADP, right? Yeah. Um, but to be honest, when it comes to the, the rankings and the projections, I'm not really taking that stuff into account at all. And one thing I always tell people is that's why you can't just draft off of rankings. You want to use the rankings as a big data point for sure. But if I have Anthony Miller, let's say, uh, of the Bears, if I have him ranked as a, an eighth round pick, you definitely don't need to take him in the eighth round. You can get him much later in drafts. But that's just to give you an idea of how valuable he is. So depending, you have to make a decision in your league. How sharp is everybody in your league? Are you playing with just kind of casual fans? Are people going to know about Anthony Miller? When do you have to pull the trigger on him? You might want to jump a round or two ahead of his ADP to make sure you get him if you feel really strongly. But it's not just drafting off the ADP because if you're just going off the ADP, you're probably going to make some picks and lose a lot of value in the draft where you could pick that up by kind of looking at both and comparing them and making maybe your own rankings of where you want to take guys. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, that's fundamental to, to anything. Cause you, you, the worst thing you can do is have a guy who you rate in the top six and, and take him as a top six player when you can get him, you know, at pick 58, pick 60, and then pick up the other guys and have an even stronger, uh, stronger squad. I think, um, with ADP, I mean, like we looked at it last year, you know, players like Chris Godwin who went and jumped three rounds and things like that. You know, clearly people were getting wise to not just the hype, but you could see the 
high stakes players, um, you know, FFPC players. You could, if you look at some of their ADPs, you can see huge shifts. You're thinking, okay, these guys are dialed in. They're sharp, sharp players. And you start seeing Chris Godwin go from a, a sixth round player to a high third play you're starting to think okay well there's, there's got to be something in that um and in some you know sometimes it, it works and sometimes it doesn't i was just curious if some of that maybe played into your thinking but then i guess you're probably already ahead of the, the curve on that in well a lot that's of but also to tie into that when i'm doing those early breakouts like i put out i put out like a super early breakouts column in like february or something but when i start to do sort of the main breakouts and bus columns right after the draft the nfl draft I use the data, the ADP from the best ball leagues, from the FFBC and stuff, because those are much, much more accurate and maybe indicative of what you're going to see come August. If you're just going off the the regular sites, you know, sort of the, the big mm. box kind of sites, the ADPs there, there's not a lot of people drafting in those. And I think a lot of them are dependent on human drafters to help, you know, curb the ADPs they're not really indicative until maybe August when a lot of people dive in there. So you want to look at those best ball leagues where there's money on the line. People are going to be a little more dialed in with that stuff uh, earlier in the off season, even going back to when they open and like, you know, March and, and April and stuff, even before the draft. So always be looking at, at those ADPs uh, versus just, you know, I won't mention any sites, but some of the, you know, the, the sites that rely on the more casual fans coming in. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we play on a couple and one of them only updated their bye weeks about three weeks ago. He's <laughs> <laughs> in there like, oh, okay. Be drafting it's, uh, you know, wrong bye weeks, etc. 